stories about growing old, about comparisons with happier Christmases, about loved ones getting cancer and so forth. So pretty much, in other words, their joy in Christmas had been stolen by troubles. Their joy in Christmas had been stolen by troubles. There are seven major problems that, that we as people we face during the Christmas season. And the first one, it, it, it's finances. You know, we never have enough money to get the best Christmas present for our child. We don't have enough money to get all the presents that we want, plus pay the bills. So finances are a huge problem uh, for us during the Christmas season. The second problem that we face sometimes is stress. It doesn't even have to be Christmas time, and I'm stressed. Right? We stress about shopping. We stress about the dinner preparations. We stress about the decorations. We stress so that the get-together is perfect. The third thing that sometimes we have problems with is loneliness. You know, stats say that 43% of Americans are single and 27% of Americans live alone. Loneliness. <coughs> the fourth problem that we run into is grief. During the, during the Christmas season, we run into grief. We miss, we're missing that deceased loved one. You know, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do Christmas this year because so-and-so is not here with me this year. Grief. The fifth one is estrangement. We, we have that problem, especially with our family, that, you know, maybe we're not on good talking terms right now. And, and because of that, we get that guilt and, and that shame of, Man, that's my family. But we also have that inner conflict of whether or not, do I really want to go to that family get-together and it be awkward? The, the sixth one is divorce. because That makes us think of a happier Christmas. This year is just not going to be the same. And the last problem we face during the Christmas season that I, I sometimes have an extremely hard time dealing with is trying to please others. Okay? We try to please others and we, we're expected to do certain things or, or we try to um, meet everyone's expectations. And for the most part, we probably always fail. My point is that troubles have been associated with Christmas since the very first one. Okay, and that's what I, I want us to read into um, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18. And I want to read, and we'll drop down to 24, and then we'll go over to Luke and do a comparison. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. <clears throat> Let's jump over to verse 24. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. And then I also want to go, like I said, to Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time had come for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So we have this, this perfect Christmas, this supposedly perfect Christmas, you see, Mary's 
part of the Christmas story is when she first got a visit from an angel telling her about this miraculous conception. You see, she was told that the son that she was going to have was going to change the world. But this was also followed by a time of a lot of circumstances that seemed to contradict God's great purposes for this child. So with supposedly this perfect and wonderful Christmas, we see Mary and Joseph having troubles on their own. And so how did Mary and Joseph cope with these troubles? Or how did they celebrate Christmas when the Grinch showed up? So I want us to, to look at Joseph's perspective, Mary's perspective, and then once we are finished with that, I want us to kind of look at their troubles along the way. So we'll start off with Joseph's perspective. And, and I mean, look at Joseph. Poor Joseph. He and Mary's marriage is already off to a bad start. Mary's turned up pregnant during the engagement. And, and Joseph knew it wasn't his child. How do you think that would make him feel? I'm assuming he was probably extremely angry at the fact that her so-called unfaithfulness. He was probably embarrassed because half of his friends are like, Joseph, you are an idiot for wanting to stay with her. She is pregnant and it's not your child. And the other half are probably, Joseph, is this your fault? You see, Joseph's reputation took a little bit of a hit. He probably was filled with sorrow as well because he loved Mary so much. His whole life had been planned around her. And he was extremely sorry because she ruined her own life. So if we look at Joseph, what to do now? What to do now? I believe it's in Deuteronomy chapter 22 where the old Jewish law says that if um, you catch an adulteress, you, you are to stone them to death. Joseph didn't want to do that because he loved Mary so much, he was willing to divorce her quietly. Here we have Joseph and in the center of God's will and disaster strikes. Why did God allow this to happen? Why? I want you to know the story's not over. You see, God sent an angel to Joseph to let him know that Mary was carrying the Savior of the world, the Son of God. God brought peace to, to Joseph's storm, Joseph's disaster, and I'm telling you, He will bring peace in yours as well. So, as we move on to Mary's perspective, I want us to know that she was, a, she was a righteous woman at the time. And yet, she became, she became looked down upon because of her pregnancy that was not caused by sin. And I'm assuming about after, you know, six months, you start to show. And once Mary started to show, I'm assuming those rumors started to crank up. Hey, did you hear about Mary? Hey, Mary's pregnant. It's not Joseph's. Hey, Mary. Do you see that happening? So... I'm assuming we've all been accused of things that we haven't necessarily done before, so we know exactly how Mary felt. We know exactly how Mary felt. She was innocent, and everyone believed that she was guilty. She was labeled as an adulteress. See, God intervened in her life, and He will intervene in yours. So we see how Joseph and Mary's reputation and their lives during this first Christmas wasn't necessarily perfect. 
So let's look at the journey to Bethlehem. I want us to imagine Mary. Uh, husbands, I want you to imagine your wife or your daughter. At nine months pregnant, about to give birth, swollen and aching all over. Okay, we have that mental image. But now, she's traveling about 70 miles. <coughs> Traveling about 70 miles. And that's, back then it was probably more than three days worth of traveling. Up and down mountains and ravines. In hot and cold temperatures. There were bandits and wild animals everywhere. And she wasn't in any fancy car. She was riding on a donkey. Or walking along the donkey. So, nine months pregnant... And she's riding on a donkey and walking 70 miles. Let's imagine that for a second. Now, today, you know, doctors tell women that are pregnant, don't travel once you get past a certain part in your pregnancy because of what can happen. She went 70 miles on a donkey being nine months pregnant. And then all of a sudden... The birth pains start to come in, the contractions are starting, and, and I know at that point, you know, we got to get to it. We got to get where we're going. We got to get to the hospital, right? There's no time to mess around. <clears throat> so I'm assuming Joseph's knocking on the door saying, Hey, my wife's nine months pregnant. She's about to have a baby. Can we please come in here? No, I'm sorry, we're full. So I'm assuming he's running to the next door, knocking on, Can we please come in here? My wife's pregnant, and she's about to have a baby. We have nowhere to be. No. No, no, no. <laughs> Joseph's probably like, have I made a mistake? What is happening? Didn't the angel say a son of God was coming? Where's the son of God now? There was no anesthesiologist there. There was no doctor. There was no comfortable bed. It was just a barn or manger and some hay. <clears throat> what a disappointment. What a disappointment. What a desperate situation Mary and Joseph were in. They had nowhere to go. It's kind of like the Christmas in Whoville. And the Grinch. When the Grinch stole all of their presents, all of their decorations, all of their food. So how could the people in Whoville still have Christmas? I want us to remember this. That no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the people thought, no matter how Mary and Joseph felt, no matter how rough the journey was, or how lowly the birthplace was, Christmas still came. Despite all the troubles that came along the way for Mary and Joseph, Christmas still came. The child was still born. Hope came. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us today? It means God and His Word was proven true then, and God and His Word is proven true today. If we look up on the screen, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. You see, Mary and Joseph did not see the hand of God working in their lives that first Christmas. But He was there. We may not see the hand of God working in our lives, but He is there. I ask you to hang on to God's Word, and it will be proven true. We will have victory. See, even though everything didn't go right for Mary and Joseph, God still accomplished His purpose for them. Even though things may not be going right in our life, God can still 
accomplish His purpose for you. How God heals the pain of Christmas. Okay? If we look up on the screen on the right side, we see a verse from Isaiah chapter 7, um, verse 14. And on the left side, you see the Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. I compared these right here. And, and what it is, it's the prophecy being fulfilled. Um, and Isaiah says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be conceived and give birth to a son and will be called a man. And in Matthew it says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So how does God heal our pain this Christmas? It's because he is with us. You see, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born for us. To be born fully human. Sharing in our poverty, sharing in our troubles, sharing in our weaknesses and struggles. He was born for us. And then so we will never be alone. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he says, I am with you until the end of the world. I want you to remember that no matter what's going on, God is with you. Paul, Paul called, to, called God the God of comfort. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Do I have that up there? I don't have that up there. But it says, Who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. By the comfort, whereas we ourselves are comforted by God. So God is a God of comfort. So if you're hurting this Christmas season, I want you to know that it's the nature of God to comfort you. It's the nature of God to comfort you. All we have to do is pour our hearts out to Him. And to cling on to His Word. And if we do that, He promises a future hope. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it reads, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. So in that time, we won't have any more stress. <coughs> or worries or troubles. Or sadness. We won't have to go to work. I'd like that, right? We won't have to go to the doctor. We won't have to pay the bills. We won't have to pay taxes. We won't have to worry about the future. So this morning, I, I, I want to give you a little bit of some practical steps when the Grinch shows up this Christmas of what you can do and take action now. If you're lonely, I ask that you get involved with something. Get involved with a ministry here at the church or get involved within the community. I know that the affordable Christmas program is on the 15th. The Wayside Inn can always need help. There's always things in our community to do. So when we feel lonely, let's get involved. Or... I want you to find someone that's in a similar position you are and make plans with them this Christmas season. Get together. Let each other know that you love one another. Or if you're feeling desperate, I ask that you please tell someone because God tells us what we're here for. We're here to love on one another. Let someone know so that you can receive their love. And as I wrap up, I want to talk about one other movie. Have any of you seen The Man of Steel? No, nope, just Alan. 
the Man of Steel. Okay, it, it's a, a Superman movie. So I guess my point might not make sense to a lot of you. But that in 2013 when that movie came out, it drew a large amount of people to the theaters. Okay, I mean people, it was packed. And a lot of people thought that the, the special effects was the reason for the popularity. And some people just said it was because of the long-standing Superman mythology. But Amy Adams, the actress who played Mrs. Lane in the movie, she had a different opinion. She said, who doesn't want to believe in one person who can save us from ourselves? Who doesn't want to believe in one person who can save us? ourselves. Well, I'm telling you, that's what Christmas is all about. It's that God sent this one person so that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. God sent Jesus Christ for you and for me. So this morning during our time of invitation, if you are wanting that peace, Prince of Peace. Or if you're, you know, you're in the time where the Grinch just showed up and you're like, Father, I need you now more than ever. And you want to be baptized, I'm telling you, there's no way, no better way to celebrate Christmas than to giving your life to the Lord. Or if, you know, Christmas season's always a hard time for you and you need prayer just to make it through. I would be more than happy to pray with you. I would be more than happy to love on you. This Christmas season, let's not forget what it's about. Troubles may come, but guess what? God is always there. So if you have a decision to make this morning, just please do it. Don't hesitate. Please stand as we sing your final song. Of the invitation.